for the word. I'm so excited to share this word this morning. Every time I get a word, it burns within me and, and I'm, I can't wait to get it out. So when it's out, then I'm like, ooh, come, let's go watch a movie and eat some popcorn and drink some Coke. <laughs> That's my thing. So God has a word for us today and I'm so glad that you are here. Don't miss Sundays. Don't miss the gathering of the saints. Come together. We need each other. Together we're stronger. Together we, we, we fight battles braver. Amen. We leave this place with more faith within our souls, with more courage to meet the week ahead. So I'm so glad that you are here. This word, as I said, has been in my spirit for now almost maybe two months, ever since um, our dear Auntie Margaret passed away. And as I stood at her grave, you know, I begin to search my heart and begin to speak to God and begin to ask him questions and felt God begin to speak. Not long after she passed, another one of our sisters, her mom passed away. And I, again, I found myself standing in front of a grave asking those same questions. And I pray that by the end of this service that you would get such a grip, such a grip of God, that you would search your hearts, that you would realign yourselves to who he is to his purposes, to his will. As I stood at those graves, I began to ask God, God, what matters to you? What really matters to you? After everything that has needed to be said is said, everything that needed to be done is done. When I close my eyes and I'm in your presence, what do I bring with me? What do I carry with me that is of eternal significance, that has value in eternity? You see, as a pastor, you know, sometimes I can go online on Instagram and look at what other pastors are doing and look at their church and, oh my God, look at the lights, look at the screens, and then you feel a bit intimidated. Look at, their, oh my gosh, look at all that's good, look at their stage. The struggle is real, guys. <laughs> it's real. And we can get so, you know, sometimes I can get so carried away by all of those things. You know, as, as, as a friend to others, you know, am I praying them into their next financial breakthrough or, or their promotion? These things are good. These things are important in life. But is that all that I'm cultivating? I'm helping them to grow in their life. As a mom, what am I teaching my children? And I can be quite a tiger mom, you know, all the moms in the house. Stop being on your phone. Go and study now. No, I'm paying money for you to study or sit on your phone. Play football the whole day or do well in your exams. I want A's. A's. I want what? I want A's. <laughs> the Clarence is like... <laughs> and sometimes I get, get so carried away with the achievements, with you know what, doing well in their studies. And these things are important. But what am I really cultivating within their hearts, their young lives? What am I helping them to grow? What is significant that I can bring when I meet Jesus face to face, when I see him? When Jesus returns, the Bible says this world will roll away like an old rag. The chair that you're sitting on, this place that we come to worship every week, that car that you drove in to the car park this morning, that house that you stay in, that job that you go to, all these things will go. What remains? What stays? What lasts? What carries with me from this earth into eternity? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 13, he says, And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Faith, come on, say it out with me, faith, faith. Hope, hope, and love. And the greatest is, and the greatest is love. And so it's wise, my friends, to build our lives on things that will last. Psalm 90, it says, teach us to number our days 
that we may grow in wisdom. See, wisdom is not just about knowing what's the difference between good and what's bad. That's pure common sense. You know what's right and what's wrong. You know what's good and what's bad. But wisdom is knowing the difference between what is good and what is best. And when we look, when we carry, when we look at our, our circumstance, everything that we hold so dear to our hearts, when we wade in against the reality, not the assumption, not the what if, the reality of eternity, what carries weight? So let's realign our hearts this morning. Let's reprioritize, let's search our hearts, let's search our worlds, our minds, let's bring it all under the Lordship of Christ and let's all ask that burning question, what matters to you, God, at the end of the day when everything is said and everything is done, what do I bring to you? What do I carry from my life here into eternity? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you are good. We are grateful that you are faithful. We are grateful that you are here, you are near, you never forsake us. We are chosen as what that song we just sang, that you are fighting our battles for us. And so now as we sit under your voice, under your leadership, under your instruction, under your word, may it come alive. May it quicken us within our spirit, cutting away things that are not from you. We yield ourselves, we submit ourselves to you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Realign thoughts that may have gone skewed, realign our heart. Give us a fresh heart, a new heart, as what your word says. A heart of flesh. Fill us again, Holy Spirit. Fill us again, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. We ask in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. And so my text today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The message version says this, and I like because it expands a little bit more on this verse. It opens it up just a little bit more. In verse 13, it says, But for right now, until that completion, that completion, that completeness talks about the time when Jesus returns. So we have three things to do. These things we ought to put into practice. It's something we actively do in our lives. Three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. Now notice it says these three, three things are important. They are of eternal value. And not just that. These three things, listen to me, it helps carry you through to the end. See, we don't want to just start well, but we want to end well. We want to end strong. Amen. Can I have a good amen? How many of you here want to end strong? You want to end well. You want to run this race right till the end and says, yes, Jesus. And so in order to be able to run this race, in order to be able to, to, to walk this, this, this talk, we need these three things, these three areas in our lives. We need to cultivate. Now, the enemy knows this as well. And so let me tell you this, he will try to steal your faith. He'll try to kill your hope and he'll try to destroy your love for God and for others. You look in the book of Job, the enemy took away everything Job had. His finances, his health, his children, his wealth, even the love of his wife, he took away everything. But what was Job, what was the enemy's agenda? What did he want to do? He said, if I take away all of Job's blessing, if you take away God, your hand of protection upon him, he will turn around and he will curse you to your face. What was Job after? Was Job, what was the enemy after? Was he after Job's children? Was he after his wealth? He was after Job's faith in God. He was after Job's hope trust in God. He was after Job's love for God. Last week, Pastor Clarence preached an amazing message. How many of you were here? 
He talked about Peter. If you were not here, I want to encourage you, encourage you to go and listen to it. It was an incredible word. And in, in, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to Peter, says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Notice that the enemy brings destruction. It is the enemy that brings chaos. He comes in to sift you, meaning he's come to bring a great shaking in your life. He said, but I have prayed. And how many of you are glad that Jesus, even right now, is standing at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you and for I. He is praying for us at this very moment. And he says, I pray for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail that your faith. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is faith. It's about faith. The same Peter, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 1 Peter in chapter 1. The same Peter who knows very well what it means to go through a time of testing, a time of shaking, go through a time that is stormy and the weather is rough, the boat is shaking. The same Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Aren't you glad that you can have hope because of God's abundant mercy? Mercies that are new Every morning, we can have a living hope, a hope that doesn't fade away, that doesn't tarnish after a while, a hope that can never die, a hope that is alive and it is living and it is well because we have a merciful God, a God who loved us, who sent His own Son to die for us on the cross, to take our punishment. Imagine if Jesus at the last moment said no. I'm not going to do this. It's too hard. It's too painful. I'm good with the healings. I'm good with the miracles. I'm good with being born in a, in a manger, in a kandang kerbau. Well, that's all good, but dying on a cross. Imagine if he did, said that. Where would we be today? Where would we be today? But because of his love, because of his mercies, we can have hope and it is living hope it says in verse 4 to an inheritance how many of you know that you have a great inheritance it is incorruptible it is undefiled that does not fade away it is reserved in heaven for you who in verse 5 everybody say who who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Who are kept by God? Do you know that you are kept by God? That God is the one who sustains you. It is God who strengthens you. We are kept. We are protected by God. Now, but listen to this. Through faith. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Your faith activates the preserving power of God to protect you, to keep you. Our faith is of utmost importance, friends. Our faith. In this, in verse 6, it says, You greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Trials come to all of us. It's something that we can never escape while we live here on earth. And it comes in many forms, in many shapes. It comes through a marriage difficulty. It comes through a financial strain. It comes through a wayward child. It comes through a sickness, a doctor's report, a lawyer's letter. Trials come in many forms and in many ways. And it's okay to grieve. Now, some of us think, you know, I need to be a strong Christian. You know, like Superman. Bullets fly at me, just bounces off my muscular chest. Or if I'm a woman, wonder woman. No, it's all right to grieve. It's all right to sometimes cry, to feel a little down. It's all right. God is able to use that grief. He's able to use that trial to turn it around, to work it out for your good. He is able to do anything if you will give it to Him. 
In verse 7, it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. Think about that. Our faith is not just maybe equal to gold. It's not just more valuable than gold. It is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this. God wants to reward your faith. That when He returns, that we are not ones who say, oh my God, Jesus is here. No, He wants, when He returns, He says, Jesus is here. And He wants to reward you and say, wow, well done. It's a huge party, a huge celebration. Well done, good and faithful service. He wants to give you praise. He wants to honor you. He wants to glorify you. God wants to reward you and He wants to reward you for your faith. And so it's so important to know that our faith is of utmost worth, greater than a a million diamonds, greater than a million cars or a million houses or the next promotion or whatever it is your heart's desire, your faith, friends. And I pray that you get it into your spirit today and that your eyes are open to see that your faith, your faith, your faith is more precious than anything anything else in this world. And so your faith will go through times of testing. See, God knows your level of faith, but we don't, don't we? We think like, we, I'm pretty good. No, I'm strong in my faith. You know, I'm good. Then we go through a time of testing. And then only can we see, like for example, my son, he says, you know, I'm good at algebra, no problem. X and Y, you know, it's never even lost, I know. Algebra is really good. So until he goes through an exam, a test, and then you see whether he's really good at algebra. In the same way for us, when we go through a test, then we can see if our faith is sincere, whether our faith is genuine as what the Bible says, whether there is strength in our faith. And God wants our faith to be strong. He wants our faith to be sincere. And when we go through times of testing, our faith is being purified. You see, there are things in life that creep up on us without us least expecting, isn't it? When, when, when they put gold into fire to purify it, it removes all those unwanted material that has been stuck on it so that it doesn't shine as bright as it should shine. And us in our lives, you know, we don't realize it. We're not bad people. There's nothing, you know, we just go through life and things just begin to creep up and it begins to choke at us. You see that, that parable of that seed that fell on the soil, remember that parable? Some fell on the ground, stony ground, and then there was one, the seed that fell and the weeds came up. Now, you don't throw a seed on the ground and immediately, jung, the weeds come up, yeah, attack the seed, no. The weeds just, just grow silently, quietly next to the seed as the seed is happily growing. I'm happy to be a Christian. And then all these other weeds come up and the weeds are the worries of our life. Financial trouble, my job, security, my career. My studies, all these things start to creep up. And notice this, it doesn't, it doesn't kill the, the seed. What happens is it, it makes the seed become unfruitful. So this is not a question about whether you're going to make it to heaven or not. This is about how fruitful you are here on earth. God wants to purify us so that we will shine and we will shine bright here on earth. And as we walk through this life, that these things in life will not crowd over us. It will not choke us. It will not come into our life and stop us from what God has called us to do so that we can shine and we can shine bright. Your faith is worth more than anything else on the earth. Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith? Men and women of God are faith. See, our agenda is not like God's agenda. We don't like the pain. We don't like the struggle. We don't like the storms. But God... In fact, he is really willing that we go through times of testing. Jesus promised, in this world, you will have tribulation. Don't be surprised by it. He's not disturbed. He's not worried. In fact, there are times, as what Pastor Clarence preached last week, that we will fail. 
I will fail the test of faith. You will fail the test of faith. You know, remember in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to Peter, I pray that your faith will not fail. He doesn't say, I pray that you will not fail because he knew very well that Peter will fail. He said, before the, at the end of the day, you're going to deny me three times. It's not about you failing. It's that about your faith not failing. Failure need not be the end. Failure is a chance for a new beginning in Christ's strength. If you're taking down notes, write this down. Failure is not the end. It's a chance for a new beginning living in Christ's strength. In His weakness, in our weaknesses, Christ's strength is made perfect. In Proverbs, it says, Though a righteous person falls seven times, it's a righteous person that falls. A Christian, a one who professes Jesus is Lord, we fall, we stumble, we fail, but we rise again. Turn to your neighbor and say, rise again. Rise again. Though a righteous person falls seven times, seven talks about number of completeness. That means he's a complete failure. But we rise again. In Psalm, it says the steps, I love this Psalm, it, it, I, I shared it last week in the evening service, the steps of a man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. And so that means we are walking with God, right? Our steps are ordered by the Lord and God's delighting in where we are going. Though he falls, so we can be very much walking with God, but there are times that we will make mistakes and we will fall, but it says this, he will not be overwhelmed. For the Lord is holding His hand. Isn't that amazing? You know, there are times that we let go of God and we say, God, I can't do this anymore. I want to throw in the towel. You know, I want to give up. I can't do this anymore. But God never gives up on us. He's there holding our hands. And though we may fall and we may make mistakes and we may fail, but we will not be ones that are overwhelmed. For God, the creator of all the heavens and the earth, the same hands, they created us and formed us out of dust. The same hands that were laid on the sick and that watched them recover who raised the dead to life are the same hands that is upon your life, that is upon my life, that is upon the life of your children. You will not be overwhelmed in Isaiah 43 when you pass, not if you pass. When you go through hard times, when you pass through, passing through, you're not making your bed there and sleeping in the deep ends of waters, you're just passing through. When you're passing through the waters, God says, I will be with you. He is with you, friends. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Things can get ugly in our lives. There are times you will not understand why things happen the way they do. But let us have courageous faith, bold faith to stand right in the middle of our difficulty. Like Shadrach, I love these three young boys, three young boys in a foreign land facing death. They can feel the heat upon their faces and they tell the king and they say this, my God will deliver me from the fire. He will deliver me, they say. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idols. We will not worship that carven image. May we have bold faith. Come on, church. That says, I don't care what it takes. I am going to have tenacious faith. I'm going to hold on to God. I will not let him go. If this thing comes true, then all glory to God. I have escaped this furnace. But even if this thing doesn't come true, I will still not bow down my knees to the system of this world. I will still not bow down my knees to doubt and defeat. For God is with me. I shall not be overwhelmed. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Yet I will praise him. Yet I will worship him. Yet I will continue to stand for him. He says, and we know, we read the Bible. We know it wasn't, whatever he went through wasn't at the hand of God. The enemy came to destroy all that he had. And he didn't understand. He didn't have the right perception, but we do. And he says, even if I get it wrong, even if 
What I see doesn't match up with what the, what the Word of God says. I will not let go of God. I will continue to stand for Him. I will continue to be, have my faith founded in Him. I will die believing and trusting and worshipping and praising my God. I am not giving up on my God. And I will trust in the Lord with all of my heart. I will lean not on my own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all of my heart. I will lean not. Lean, leaning is, is putting your weight, your weight on something. This pulpit, it's not meant to carry my weight. I'm worried it's just going to collapse under me. Um, but when we put our weight on something, when we lean on something, the weight of our life is not meant to be carried by our own understanding. Our strength is not found in our wisdom. Our confidence does not lie in our own reasoning. If you can understand everything there is about God, or oh, this is how He does things, this is how His, he, he, His ways are, then you have reduced God to your size. See, understanding is good, but trust is even better. And you will go through times that you don't understand. That there will be no answers. But you just got to keep on trusting. Keep on believing. Now we see in 1 Corinthians, it says in chapter 13, now we see in a mirror, we see dimly. We don't understand. We see in part. We see part of the picture. But one day we will. One day all will be revealed. There will come a time that we will understand. Some parts of our lives now are meant to be lived in mystery and we ought to leave it there. It's not our job to try and reason everything out. Then only we will have faith. Then only we will believe. No, Jesus said, if you will believe, you will see the glory of God, that God is working out all things for your good. Fight, friends. Fight. Be determined this morning to fight the good fight of faith. And how do we do it? Hebrews talks about faith being the substance of things hoped for. Faith is substance. The evidence of things not seen, faith is evidence. Substance is something tangible. In the spirit realm, faith is something that is tangible, it's real. Evidence is something that is solid proof. Faith is not just some hazy emotion, just, you know, being in a cloud. No, no, it's grounded on the reality of who God is. Get to know your God. Get to know His Word. Don't depend on just our words, what we say about God. Get to know Him for yourself. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Get to know. Get into His Word. Dig into His Word. And you will find that He is faithful. That He is true. Over and over and over again, men have stood in the same place that you have. And they have found that God is faithful. That God is true. That truly He works all things out for our good. Get into His presence. Get into His Word. Men shall not live by bread alone. Amen. But by every word that proceeds, God is speaking. He is always speaking. And our life is not meant to be sustained just by our nasi lama and our nasi kanda. I feel like a nasi kanda after this. How many of you are with me? Banana leaf. <laughs> but our life is sustained by the word of God. You need to get into the word of God. It is solid proof. It is tangible proof that our God is a good God. He is a faithful God. Now let me tell you, when you read the word, your windows are not going to fly open. There's not going to be a hurricane. And then a big cloud's going to jump in and say, I am the God. of No, no, it's a still, small voice. And as you meditate on his word, as you spend time in his presence, he will just drop a word in your spirit. Write it down, journal it down, memorize it, declare it, pray it, sing it, shout it at the top of your lungs. Hold on to it. The Word of God will bring and will build faith in our lives for at the right time when God brings deliverance, we can truly say that me and my faith, we have come forth as pure gold. Some of us are going through a test today and I pray what Jesus prayed for Peter, not that we will not go through times of testing. That is unrealistic. If only, you know, I could just sit next to a pool and be away from all this trouble, you know, go to the beach and listen to the 
Those are nice things to have, but life will always throw us things least when we expect it to. But may we say, like, I love what Paul says. After everything that's said is said, done is done. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. How many of you can say again amen to that? I've kept the faith. The second thing we need to fight for to remain in our life is hope. Faith is built upon hope. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Some of us are struggling with hope. We feel despair. We feel hopelessness. In our world today, with all of life's technology and food and entertainment, you would think people would get happier, they would get healthier, marriages would work better, but we find that it's the reverse. Divorce is on the rise, mental illnesses is on the rise, people are breaking down and a lot of it, the root of it is a sense of just feeling hopeless. How many of you are glad that God is a God of hope? In Romans 15, in verse 13, if, if you are facing a situation that you find is, oh my gosh, this is hopeless. I'm giving up on this. Get into this scripture. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, now, now, not later, not someday, but right here and right now in your present situation, now, may the God of hope. Now, a lot of people out there, they, they have a lot of gods out there and a lot of names for their God, but aren't you glad our God is called the God of hope? He's a God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take apart this scripture now. He's a God of hope. In Jeremiah 29, he says, I'm here to give you a future and to give you hope. So this is the God we serve. You can have living hope because there's resurrection power on the inside of you. Think about that. Think about that the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Three days, Jesus was in that tomb. And that supernatural power that poof, brought him up to life, that poof, burst open that tomb, is that same power that is within you. And so they can put you in a tomb and try to close it, but you're going to burst forth. They can try to kill you and your joy and your peace. Your office colleagues may talk a lot of stuff behind your back, but it cannot diminish your hope because it is living. It is alive and it cannot die. You may be going through a storm in life today, but let me tell you this. You are going to get to the other side. Not just because Jesus is in your boat, but because Jesus is within you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says the God of hope will fill you, not may fill you, He will fill you. With all joy and peace, so that you will abound. So joy and peace leads to hope. Joy and peace overflowing so that we are continually abounding in hope, in God. Biblical joy and peace, these two are important things. It's not things that you can find out there. You see, happiness is based on happenings. Good times, I'm happy. My fault with my husband, I'm angry. My children irritate me, I'm grouchy. And today is my birthday, I'm joyful. No, joy... It's an inner delight in God and His sure promises. It gives us comfort. It gives us contentment in every situation. Peace, inner contentment and freedom from fear, from worry, from anxiety. How do we fill up with joy and with peace? Two ways. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. We must believe, friends. And keep on believing in God and in His Word. I love this scripture in Lamentations. You know, Je Jeremiah, Jeremiah here is talking. He's going through a time of grief. His nation had just been destroyed. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he, they've taken away all his family, his nation. They've destroyed the temple which the Jews loved. They used to go there to worship. The King he, he destroyed everything took away his nation as a hostage. And he's in deep grief. He's lamenting in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. But he begins to say this. He says, This 
I recall to my mind. In the middle of his trouble, in the middle of what he's going through, he willfully takes action. He rises up within himself and he says, this I, not my mother, not my husband, not my wife, not my pastor, but he says, this I recall to my mind and therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness, indeed it never ceases. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And he says this is his key. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I have hope. You know, some of us say, no, Pastor Debbie, I've hoped before, you know. I prayed to God to change the situation and it didn't change. Then let me ask you this question. Where was your hope placed? Was it placed on the doctor to do something? Was it placed on a certain person to behave the way you wanted them to behave? Was it placed on a situation to turn out the way it was? Or was it based on Jesus Christ? Because you see, Scripture says hope does not disappoint. And so if you've been disappointed with hope, and we've all been there, I've been there, praying for something that didn't turn out the way that it happened to be. Let me tell you this, build your hope on Jesus Christ. Everything may go from your life. Everything can be taken away from you. But if you build your life on Jesus Christ, you have it all. You have it all. Jesus is all we need in our lives. He in, uh, is who we depend on. He is whom we live for. Where has your hope been placed? Hope does not disappoint. He is our portion, Jeremiah says. He is my exceedingly great reward. He is my shield. He is my comfort. He's the God of hope. And the God of hope wants to meet you today. Some things you have let go of and you've dropped because of disappointment. God's saying today, hope again. Hope again. Begin to hope again for I am the God of hope. And I'm able to turn all things, work all things out for your good. Because I love you. And as we believe and keep on believing, it says this abundant hope, Divine means of this abundant hope. It also comes, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the power of God. It created the universe. The power of God is resurrection power. Holy Spirit opens up our minds to understand truth. The Holy Spirit is power that produces His holiness. I love this, this hymn. It says, my hope is built on nothing less. How many of you know this hymn? I love the words. It says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he... He, He, Jesus Christ, is all my hope and stay. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, in Him my righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Some of you here feel that you can't move forward. But let me encourage you to keep standing. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And finally, the last thing that ought to be in our lives that we need to fight to keep, to hold on to, to build our lives upon is love. 
In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 13, it says, in verse, though, in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes in all things, love endures all things, love never fails. And what that says to me is that I can do great things for God and God does want to use us in a powerful way in this day and age that the church would shine bright. But I can do the right things and speak with such eloquence and prophesy and give my body to be burnt, die a martyr's death, but yet if my motivation... You see, men look at the outside... Wow, that's awesome, man, what they're doing for God. That's so cool. But God looks at the inside. And I can do all of these great things, but if my motivation is not love for God and love for others, then the Bible says, not I said, that it profits us nothing. It is worthless in the end. And the enemy will try to numb us, isn't it? Love is hard. He tried to harden our hearts, make our heart feel callous. Ah, whatever lah. They are problem lah, not my problem. Too bad lah, serves them right lah, you know. They deserve it lah. It's their fault lah. And why? Because we best represent Jesus when we love. John 13, Jesus said this in verse 35, By this... Everyone will know you're my disciples, not how great our building is, not the amount of mouths we feed by all our charitable deeds. No, he said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you love, if you love one another. God is love. As much as God is holy, He's a God of justice. His primary motivation for what He does is love. It says, for God so loved the world that He gave. It's not because He said, this is the right thing to do. Lah. This is the right thing. I'm a holy God. I'm a God of justice. This is the right action to take. He said, no, because of love. Because of love. And God is love. The scripture says, God is love. Let me speak to the ladies here today. You know, some of us are looking for man's love. A man to love you, to fill that void. But God is saying to you today, I am love. Man may love and man will disappoint. But God cannot fail. He will not disappoint. Because He is love. Look for your love in Him. Look for your comfort in Him. Look for your strength in Him. Deep within us, we want to be loving. We want to love our spouse. We want to love our husbands. Help me, God. We want to love our children. We want to love each other in the church. We want to love our colleagues. But it's difficult. In fact, it is nearly impossible for us to love others unless we genuinely are first convinced that we ourselves are loved. And God's love can change that, friends. We can find all the acceptance and all our affections we crave in Him. And then with that confidence that we are loved, we can then extend it to others. We love, as John says, because He first loved. In Ephesians, in chapter 3, Paul prays this powerful prayer. And I prayed many times for you guys. And there's so many things that I pray for. But God always reminds me of this scripture. Paul says, I bow my knees. Now, this, is, this isn't just a normal type of prayer. 
He says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the home family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might. That means to have power. The power to do what? Through His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth and the height to know the love of God which passes knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. I know God loves me, but do you know? How many of you know this morning that Jesus Christ is crazy, he's madly in love with you? Sometimes we feel God does love me, the atmosphere like this. Yes, he does. And sometimes when we go through a, a difficult time, it's like, God, do you love me? What's going on? What's going on with this situation? And I pray, and I pray that you will pray this prayer as well for your families, for your life, for our church, that we will know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you will be filled to all the fullness of God. See, we all want to be filled to the fullness of God, don't we? We don't want to just be touch and go Christians. We want to be full of God. And how are we filled with God? To the fullness of God is to know His love. To know that God loves me. Not only will getting to know Him more intimately cause us to become more like Him, but resting secure in the assurance that He loves us. Listen to me, especially the ladies, listen to me with this. Resting secure in the assurance that He loves us will keep us from making demands of others and free us to reach out unselfishly and to minister to others for their benefit alone. Then we can really, truly say this in Luke chapter 6. It says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You've been freely given freedom, forgiveness. Now we should freely give in return. Fight to stay in that place of love. Fight to stay in that presence on, with Him in on a daily basis. Come before His presence. That is where He fills you. That is where He reminds you. That is where He strengthens you. We can't do this on our own. Faith, hope, and love. This is what we build our lives on. Yes, there are many things to do up ahead. Yes, there are many things to accomplish for the name of Christ, but let it be done in faith, in hope, and in love. I love this scripture, and I'm just, can you just bow your head? I'm just going to read this over you. In Psalm 139, it says, David says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every moment of my heart and my soul. You understand my every thought. Before it even enters my mind, you are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And you know all the words I'm about to speak even before I start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way and in kindness you follow me behind. To spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible. You understand, your understanding of me brings me wonder and it brings me strength. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I run and hide from your face? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you are there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever you go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me, for your presence is everywhere bringing light into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. 
The night to you is as bright as the day. There's no difference between the two. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside, my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I've even seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you are thinking of me. How precious and how wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I wake each morning, you're still with me. And he says in verse 23 this, and I pray this over every heart. God, I invite your searching grace into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. See if there is any path of pain I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious, everlasting ways. The path that brings me back to you. You know, some of us here have gone in our own way. And God's calling you back, back to Him. Not that just a knowing of His ways, but to know Him, that He is your portion. You can have hope in the worst situation because God, you are my reward. You are the love of my life. I'm going to open up this altar call for those of you.